tour and you stay with one tour guide as we go through the whole house so we're all learning how to condense everything down into like two minutes per room <laughs> so bear with us as we try to get our timing actually down really pat but um, you have entered the back part of the house so I don't know what you heard on the porch but this is the back of the house uh, outside here would have been a privacy fence and then a work yard and then where the more intricate fencing is, where it's really tightly woven, that would have been a hen and chicken yard. And our archaeologists are working in the work yard area, trying to discover the original kitchen, um, where the enslaved people would have had their quarters and things like that. And you can see evidence of some modern archaeological work that we've been doing to try to piece together the outbuildings. So this would have been the bedroom for George's mom, Mary Ball, and George's father, Augusta. So um, we are lucky in the fact that a couple of documents have survived. I know you heard how many thousands of artifacts have been discovered here, but um, another famous document has helped us piece together this house, and it's called a probate inventory. So that's where an assessor actually comes in, room by room by room, and they list every piece of furniture and the value of that furniture and where it was located. And so since that probate inventory has survived, we are able to recreate the furnishings in each room. And as you probably heard on the porch, we've hired the best period furniture makers, cabinet makers, recreated um, artisans to help us build the house back to the way it would have looked when George lived here. So you probably also know George moved here when he was six, and he'll stay here till he's 22, okay? Um, in addition to being his parents kind of bedroom space what you're looking at is the most valuable piece of furniture in the house so we normally don't think of a bed as being our most expensive <coughs> piece of furniture but uh, George's parents Mary and Augustine had a nice bed and it was the most valuable piece and what makes it nice is the drapery we've discovered a lot of the brass rings as artifacts so the curtains could have been opened and closed for privacy you could also keep heat in in the winter if you were using a chamber warming uh, device in the bed uh, this would have been very nice feathers at the top level straw and then the very nice roping here compare this to a lesser quality rope bed and then the rope bed over there uh, could have been tightened up with the wooden device. You could actually put that in the ropes and turn it. And that's where that statement, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite, comes from. Because that would have had a straw mattress on it, and we know all kinds of critters typically like to get in straw. But uh, that would have been a, a lesser quality rope bed. So the probate inventory listed this bed, also a tea set. And so we know that Mary would have had her lady friends in her bedroom space to serve tea. And ladies, today, we don't normally have our closest friends into our bedroom space and serve them tea, but in addition to being a bedroom area, it is a social space for the ladies, for Mary to invite her, be her better friends in to serve tea. And then finally, this room serves a sad purpose as well. This is where George's father, Augustine, is going to pass away. So George is here when he's six. When George turns 11, his father, Augustine, is going to die on April 12th of 1743. He'll be sick for about 12 days. We don't know if it was tuberculosis or an upper respiratory infection, but something up in this area was happening with him. And so he will pass away here in this room. And we believe Augustine would have probably had a nurse come in and stay with him his later days, and that might have been the purpose of the rope bed, because you wouldn't typically have that in a house like this at that time. So when Augustine passes away, we have another surviving document, which is his will, and his will gives us a lot of historical evidence also. You may not know, but Augustine, George's father, had been married before. He was married to a lady named Jane Butler, Jane Butler had provided Augustine with two sons, Lawrence, and then a son named Augustine Jr. So when the um, inheritance needs to be divided up, 
Um, Augustin Jr. will get the property at Pope's Creek. His older son, Lawrence, is going to get Little Hunting Creek, which is Mount Vernon today. And then George, the first son with uh, Mary, is going to get this property. So um, George will inherit Ferry Farm. It's a 600-acre working plantation. And he's only 11. Anyone 11? <laughs> Close to a, you're 11. So imagine you've now inherited 600 acres. You've inherited 10 enslaved workers. And this is your farm. However, George cannot legally inherit it until he turns 21 which is majority age. And so that leaves his mom, Mary, with a tough choice to make. If she remarries, then she could have a new husband dictate what would be done at the property, and she chooses to stay single and not remarry so that she can manage everything on George's behalf, on George's sister Betty's behalf, and the three younger children in the family. And so she does kind of take that difficult stance and remain single, but then tries to manage everything for another about 10 years. So when you go into the next part of the house, you're going to go into the dining room. And we normally in there talk about a couple of lawsuits that Mary actually encounters because she's going to be down income because she's going to lose some property to those older um, stepchildren from the first marriage. And then she's going to do her best here to control everything until George can inherit legally at 21. So you're welcome to go on into the next room. If you have any questions, let me know. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you may. Good point. And you can sit on the furniture. You can talk uh, to each other at the tea set. We just ask you try not to break anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, one thing, they didn't put carpet in the floor. Yeah, 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 what were you looking at? Oh, no, 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 Yes, you may take photos. Yes. And you can actually sit on the furniture, touch everything in the home. It's reproductions for that reason. Thank you so much. Larger and more imposing from below. 
The Rappahannock River flows there, and the city of Fredericksburg is across the way. This is as far up the Rappahannock as you can come before you hit the rapids. And so ships from all over the world come up the river here, and you can see the Washington House. This is a real landmark. In addition, the King's Highway there is a colonial road. There was a ferry that went across to Fredericksburg here, and the road to the ferry cut through the Washington's property. So all kinds of people going up and down the northern neck and to Fredericksburg and points east are crossing the Washington's property. So this is a real landmark in the colony. In the Virginia Gazette in the 1770s, there's a couple times they refer to the ferry by Mrs. Washington. So that tells me in the 1770s, there's lots of ferries that cross the river, but when they talk about Mrs. Washington's, they know that everybody knows exactly which house that is. This is the whole room. This is what the Washingtons would have furnished in a way to impress others. Um, there was a mirror in this room and in the parlor. Mirrors were extremely expensive, but one of the great things about them is that they enhanced candlelight. So if you think about those short winter days, you know, today we are bathed in electrical light. You know, we don't have to worry about being able to read and be able to move around our homes. Back in the 18th century when it was just candlelight, something like a mirror, working as close to windows as you could, doing as many tasks outside when there was enough light to do it would have been really essential. We know from the probate inventory that there are two tables in the room and 11 leather bottom chairs. And this tells us something really exciting about the way the Washingtons are dining and something that we take for granted today. With 11 leather bottom chairs, each Washington family member could have sat at the table at their own individual place setting. Most Virginians are living in a one or two room house and they're sitting at a table that has a communal trencher in benches, you know. So you're sharing a bench with someone, you're reaching and sort of eating directly from a trencher and putting it directly in your mouth. The fact that the Washingtons have enough place settings and chairs, they're at least, this family is training their family in the latest etiquette and manners to ensure that they'll stay in the gentry class, which is what the Washingtons want for their children. The fireplace is paneled, it's covered with wood. Generations earlier, even a generation earlier, the fireplace bare brick would have been visible. But by the mid-1700s, colonial Virginians have decided that they sort of want more refined to finish it. They don't want to see that rustic brickwork. And so this is another element of how the Washingtons are sort of showing the latest fashionability for the most elegant finishes, ways to impress their visitors. Now when visitors come, most Virginia houses the doorway enters right into the hall room. Most Virginians only have one room, and so everything happens in that room. The Washington's house was built um, by the Struther family in 1727, 1728, and it features this passage, what we call the hallway now. That passage allows servants or the Washingtons to evaluate company. Not everyone gets to come into the most elegant room in the house. And the furnishings are all designed to be multifunctional, sort of move to the side of the room. So if someone wants to take up a fiddle and, and have dancing in here, all this stuff can move to the edge and can be used in different ways to take advantage of that space in that way. Um, the escritoire behind you is mentioned in the probate inventory. This would have been used for keeping accounts, conducting business, Augustin Washington, when he dies, says in his will that he wants his wife, Mary, to manage the plantations of his four minor-aged sons. His two oldest sons were from an earlier marriage. One inherited what we call today Mount Vernon. The other inherited the Pope's Creek Plantation. Both plantations that are sizable enough that they're self-sustaining. The minor-aged sons don't have plantations that large, but they're so young, George is the oldest child at 11, um, that Mary is tasked with managing their plantations until they come of age. And so that shows a lot of confidence that her husband has in her. 
Um, he could have asked one of his oldest sons to do that management, but he doesn't. He asks his wife Mary to do that. And so this escritoire would have been used for that business. The family also had an iron mine at Akaki, just located six miles north of here. It's one of the things that inspired the family's move to this area. And um, that iron mine is managed by Lawrence. Augusta, Washington specifies Lawrence to manage that property. Are there any questions before I continue? Any questions about the room? Okay, so what I'm going to have you do now is head to the passage, take advantage, you can look through the view portal and see the original cellar, one of the ways that we were informed that the house was located here. Um, and then you'll go into the parlor after that. Any questions? What are the problems of this? Is this how much something is worth? Or is yes, it's that's how much it is worth. Yeah. And so it's in pounds, shillings, and pence. Wow. And that's another page of that. Chamber is the room above us. The passage you're about to enter. So the passage has a large table, a couch, and some And then the back room is the back room is the room on the other side of the park. And then the hall that we're in right now is an in-ray of that couch and walk here. So do you know how you have that one? Smoke and things, you know, to, to happy parents. 
appearances of staying in the gentry class, and she will pull this off. I mean, George does go on to bigger and better things, and Betty, the only sister who's a year younger, will marry Fielding Lewis, a rich merchant in the city of Fredericksburg. Uh, they will buy their dream house, build their dream house in 1775. If you're the sister of George Washington, that's really not a good time to build your dream house because then what happens is Fielding Lewis will use her husband, will use every penny of his fortune to fund the war, to keep our, our men, you know, with arms, he has an armory, you know, making guns and munitions. So he will die penniless. Uh, you know, Congress is supposed to be reimbursed, but nobody's getting reimbursed. I mean, the guys don't even have shoes. That, you know, and you think of Valley Forge and the rations keep getting cut. Um, and the Battle of, of Yorktown does happen. He knows about it, but uh, I, there's no context to put it in. Because I'd like to think that he knew this patriot and what he did made a difference. But in 2020 hindsight, we, we know, um, you know, but the, the British troops aren't going to pull out of York, or New York for a while and the peace treaty won't be signed. So I just fear that, you know, but he was a patriot. He gave his, his all. So, and, and the three brothers, George Washington's three brothers do have land. So they, mom does pull this off, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> and she, she gets a really bad reputation throughout history. She is pretty much villainized for uh, bucking the system, not getting in line and remarrying. She was 35 and doing it the way that she was supposed to. But she's fighting for her babies, and if you call that wrong, or uh, you know, some people call her selfish. I don't think that's. I think it's the opposite. Anyway, happy fourth. Thank you. And I'm going to send you on to my colleague now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you time you earned for the last. So uh, we start off with the room itself, and we'll talk about some of the things in here. The room itself is not part of the original house, and we noticed for several things. First thing, if you look, the ceiling's much lower here than it is in all the other rooms. Uh, when they're digging, archaeologically, they're finding things under here that would not have been here had it been built at the same time as the rest of the house. So they know it's added on afterwards. Don't know exactly why Augustin adds this room on, um, but we know it's added on after he purchases it. They think it was going to be an office space originally, um, but then on the inventory in 1743, it's listed with two nicer beds. So you saw your best bed in the first room. These are pretty decent looking beds, but nowhere near as nice as those, but they're nicer than that green bed you saw in the corner. So therefore, nicer beds. So this is kind of a guest room, more or less. Uh, so these are actually our newest pieces of furniture. Uh, we got them around Easter time into April. Uh, the bed is not, by no means complete yet. We're, we're missing plenty of pieces to it, but uh, again, that gives you an idea of what would be in here. And this bed does fold down. Mm -hmm. so, again, it's a space saver. So think about it. Just like in the other room, they told you the furniture gets moved off to the side when not used to open this, the room up. The same thing with this bed. So imagine if this is folded down, you're trying to open this door and that door. It's kind of a, a nightmare situation. But they're going to use every inch of space they have. They don't need 3,000 square feet like we have today because they're going to use all the space in the house. They're not going to make one room to eat in, a second room to play in. Everything's going to be done in one space. So I said visitors could come stay here in the 18th century. It's not uncommon to have lengthy stays at somebody's house. So Mary would put you up back here. Uh, travelers, the highway is here in the 18th century. So if you're traveling, it's getting late, you don't want to go into town and stay at a tavern, knock on the front door, ask Mary for a room, she could put you up back here. Uh, the Washington children, when they're getting older, they're going to come back to visit or to stay down here rather than the bedrooms upstairs. So, one question, who needs to use the bathroom? 
There's no one coming to your house, picking your trash up and taking it out in the middle of nowhere and dumping it for you, right? So you're dumping your trash right out the window, literally out the window. So this fence along the back of the house is there to separate the trash, or what's called the midland yard, from the rest of the property. Everybody's going to have it. It's normal. For us, it seems very, very odd and probably disgusting, but if that's what you grew up with, you wouldn't think twice about it. So it is a different time period, to say the least. Any questions on anything you've seen in the house, anything in this room? Uh, we're kind of just uh, doing an abbreviated version of the tour today. Uh, if you come back on the regular tour, you can go upstairs on that tour. We're just not doing it today because of logistics and trying to get people up and down at the same time. Anything? No questions on anything in the house? So how many bedrooms are upstairs? There's two. Uh, the, the smaller one on this side is actually listed on the inventory as a lumber room. Um, so think of attic space today. It's a storage room. When we hear lumber, we think wood. But in the 18th century, lumber is odds and ends. So it, it has a different meaning um, in the 18th century. There are no assigned bedrooms, so it wasn't this was George's room or this was George's room. He said he's probably slept in every room of the house at some point or other. This time in the summer, especially when they're younger, they're probably bringing their bedrolls down, sleeping in the passageway there, opening the front and back door, and that's their air conditioning in the 18th century. So you do get a fairly decent breeze coming through when we, when we have the few times that we can open the two doors when it's not too hot or rainy or too humid. So. Right, if you have other questions, I'll send you back out in the lovely weather. <laughs>